Only since 1907 have we known much that was worth knowing about wondrous Angkor. In that year, Siam ceded Cambodia in southeastern Asia to the French, who soon began to dig out from the depths of its impenetrable jungle the vast bones of a forgotten city. They found enthroned here, rising in a steady, masterful sweep, the five lofty towers of Angkor Wat, amid such terrifying desolation and amazing mystery as no mortal eye had beheld for hundreds of years. Now the region is gradually being repopulated. Cambodians, believed to be directly descended from the vanished Khmers who built Angkor, frequently come here from neighboring villages for their games and religious dances. Here on the causeway, in front of Angkor Wat, we witness what is called a Cambodian wrestling match. But from the antics of the contestants, it might as well be a boxing bout, a game of rugby, a musical comedy, or all three combined. Anyway, let's wait a moment and try to guess just what they are striving to do. Angkor Wat, when constructed in the 12th century, was dedicated to Vishnu, a Hindu deity. But about the time it was abandoned, Buddhism gained the upper hand. Consequently, Cambodian Buddhist priests have established a colony within the temple area and now hold occasional religious festivals here. Angkor Wat reminds me of the tale of the mystery ship found deserted on a calm sea with all sails set, a fire burning in the galley and a table laid for luncheon. Not a soul was aboard nor was there a hint of what had happened. That is Angkor Wat. It is no ruin. In its beauty and state of preservation, it is unrivaled. The roofs still turn the rains. The walls are as soft as when Khmer masons fitted them without binder or cement. The carvings on the galleries are intact, though the mighty artist the Michelangelo of the Orient, who conceived the plans and watched the creation of this wondrous fane, is unknown. A mile north of the Wat is a gateway to Angkor Thom, once a city of a million inhabitants. In its center is the Bayon, a Hindu temple, the best design, the most original, and to me, the most impressive of Angkor's 600 monuments that have been, or are being, lifted from the jungle. Descriptions and pictures can convey only a very faint notion of Angkor's bewildering greatness and marvelous beauty. Bas-reliefs cover the vast walls of the Bayon's gallery depicting Cambodian life in the 10th century. These are Khmer soldiers. Each of the Bayon's 51 stone towers represents the head of Siva, a prominent Hindu deity. And each has four elaborately carved faces of varied expressions. They smile grimly under their big flat noses maintaining an expression of ironical good nature that neither the slow labor of the forest nor the heavy dissolving rains of at least six centuries have availed to destroy. On this elephant terrace, the former kings of Angkor once slept in a tower of gold. This information is embodied in the manuscript of a Chinese envoy who resided at Angkor late in the 13th century. He described the sovereign, possibly this same leper king, as living in a palace approached over a bridge, the stone balustrades of which represent the giant bodies 
of seven-headed cobras called Nagas. According to the manuscript, all men and women, including the king, wore top knots. But in the bas reliefs, the Khmer soldiers had short hair, as do all Cambodians today. And they were armed with bows and arrows, exactly like these. Only the king, so the story goes, could dress in flowery garments. About his neck, he wore three pounds of large pearls, and on his wrists, ankles, and fingers were precious cat's eyes. Like this lad, he went barefooted, and the soles of his feet and the palms of his hands were dyed a deep crimson. When he appeared in public, he stood upright on an elephant and bore aloft a sword of gold. Indeed, his was a rich and powerful state. But that mighty nation, its people and its capital, vanished from the face of the earth at the beginning of the 15th century. These ruins, so recently extricated from the savage embrace of the jungle, frequently reveal signs of an orgy, of pillage. But by whom? Why was this most magnificent of cities, utterly abandoned by victor and vanquished, and left to the jungle and its denizens? No one knows. All that we do know is that the jungle did swallow it up, and that the Khmer Kingdom became as forgotten as if it had never existed. Amazing, impossible, and preposterous as this seems, yet these mighty ruins are here, silent, indisputable testimony of a sumptuousness and a glory that must have been the wonder of that world, even as they are of ours today. Let us return, as everyone does, to the causeway in front of Angkor Wat. We have heard of its ghosts and can scarcely believe our eyes. Girls in incredible costumes with brazen minarets on their heads enter through the temple gates, looking for all the world like a dancing troupe that has just stepped out of a sculpture piece in one of the temple galleries. Only the tinkling bodies seem real. The girls are like animated wraiths reenacting the ancient legends of the Khmer. Their dance is a series of postures. Their march step is closely patterned after the gait of an elephant. Observe how these mites of humanity are able to simulate the ponderous caution of the elephant, the slow motion of his stride, quick shift of his weight. But their chief skill is in their hand movements, fingers curving back from the palm until they almost touch the rim. And here is another freeze, please. But seriously, it seems but a